This episode is brought to you by Crazy Town and the most complicated chorus verse ever. Come, my lady, come, come, my lady. You're my butterfly, sugar, baby. Welcome to the Stefan Dyer Podcast, my people. Hello, my people. Today, man, my guest today made it happen for me in Canada. I literally may not have met my wife. I literally may not ever have been a dad ever. I may not be a. I would have not been a comedian today without today's guest, ladies and gentlemen. Diego Hidalgo Sa is a civil engineer turned serial entrepreneur and content creator. After graduating from the University of New Brunswick and working for a few years in construction management, Diego decided to make a 180 career turn to start SWA Entertainment and Event Production Business, where he organized hundreds of nightlife events for nearly eight years until COVID hit and he was forced to put his business on standby indefinitely. If you're a Latino in Toronto, you've probably been to SWA. It is life-changing and we miss it dearly. In March of 2020, he pivoted once again and co-founded Disruptive Consensus, a YouTube channel and blog in Spanish and English where he writes opinion articles and creates short videos alongside his longtime friend, the legend, Dani Gomez. This is such an incredible interview. I am so happy Diego is here. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Diego Hidalgo Sa. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Stefan Dyer podcast. I have here the legend, the unbreakable, the unmistakable, the pioneer, the visionary, the godfather of Latinos in Toronto, the bridge builder, El Ruiseñor de Quito. Damas y caballeros, Diego Hidalgo Sa. How are you, brother? How's it going, man? I've been I'm looking forward excited. to this for a while. Uh, man, when I, when I was creating this podcast, I always had you in mind. You're one of the people that has made one of the biggest impacts in my life. And... You're super smart. This is why I invited you. You're super smart. You're mega passionate. You're Latino, obviously. We share lots of things, our, our love for sports, our love for learning, personal growth, resilience, adaptability, and entrepreneurship, but mainly because you've had a profound impact in my life. So before I jump into that, I want to ask you, do you remember how we met i remember in spite of being severely intoxicated at the moment <laughs> I, I i remember clearly how we met <laughs> yeah it was in my my old place uh the biggest party spot i've ever um lived at uh with uh, our good friends danny uh, gomez and, and rodrigo isasa and i remember that uh it was af an after party one after uh after so one of my events we walked, it was very close to, to the venue where we used to host at Milagro. And we walked, uh, we walked back, it was like 40 people or something like that, walked back for the after party to this townhouse that was so sick, man. I remember that place, it was so great. Um, on Adelaide, 669, I remember clearly. And you were this really nice person. I remember like the, the morning after, <laughs> Danny and I, we were talking, remember that guy from Costa Rica it was really nice, man. He was, <laughs> was just his energy. His energy was so positive and he was just so happy, so happy to meet everybody. And we remember that you kept referring to yourself as in, in a third person as <laughs> El Tiger. <laughs> El Tiger. Was, remember, like, I don't remember his name. We just remember that he used to re refer to himself <laughs> in a third person as 
El Tiger. So we were like, just like, we need to find who this El Tiger guy is because we, we should get, invite him often. We should get El Tiger, El Tiger a beard. Uh, El Tiger wants rum. And you're like, where is El Tiger? No, it's me, right? <laughs> 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 I remember it was like salvation for me. I used to, as you know, and similar to you, I, I went to university here in Canada. You went in New Brunswick. I went here at the University of Toronto. And in some ways, and I'm not complaining here. My life was very Canadian because, especially in university, I was in a fraternity. That was my community. I I was in a program in finance and commerce where I was like I didn't know any other Latinos. And then, as I graduated university in 2010, I went and lived in Saint Clair with my two roommates, really good friends, Dean and Josh, from my fraternity. And then. Uh, I tore my ligaments. I, 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 I couldn't play soccer, which was my only connection to the Latin community. That's where I hung out with Latinos. And it was devastating for me because I, I couldn't play soccer for five years. I had three knee surgeries. So I took all my competitive energy to playing poker. And I played poker like all the time. I read a lot of books. And I remember one night in the winter of 2013, I lost in this poker tournament and I was devastated. And then someone called me and they're like, there's a Latin party downtown. And I'm like, ah, oh, whatever. I mean, this night can't get any like more horrible. So I'll just go. And I walked into this place in the second floor of Milagro on Queen. And I see like the God opened like the doors of heaven <laughs> for me. And I'm like, what? This is like this is what I've been waiting for. Like, where have all these people been? And it felt like home. I know for some people it might feel like, oh, this guy's exaggerating. But what I'm trying to say is that it was my people, my music, my way of interacting. And I felt like home away from home. And I'm like, who the fuck invented this thing, you know? And then... I knew Obama, Obama, who's who's one of my best friends and, and my roommate uh, a couple of years ago, and obviously you're a good friend. And he's like, oh, there's this after party. And I'm like, whatever, let's go. Man. Everyone started walking and we ended <laughs> yeah. up at your place. And I just didn't want to leave your house. <laughs> yeah. I remember you were the I last left one at, to leave. Yeah, I left with Obama at like 6 a.m. And in some ways I was like, it was like the sun was coming out. And he just walked one way of Adelaide and I walked the other. I didn't have anywhere to go, but I, I just didn't want to be awkward and follow him in one way. So I didn't <laughs> way. But I was like kind of expecting, I looked back and I was like kind of expecting for him to have another after party, but, <laughs> but no. And then um, I, that was the beginning. And, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because I want you to understand and all, all, like all this, our listeners, the impact that Diego has had on my life and, Realistically, I would have never met my wife, maybe, had this not happened. Because my, my group of friends became Latinos that I loved. And through it, I met, I met the, um, Dani Ascanio. I met Hector, who's your business partner in SWA. I met like a lot of our friends. And through those parties, I met my wife. Had I not... Like Liam, my son might not even exist. So, <laughs> so thank you, thank you, Diego. And You're so welcome. I met my wife, and I met at your house my husband Juan Cacaya, <laughs> <laughs> who's my now business partner. Had I never met you, maybe I would never be a comedian. Now we'll never know clearly because maybe I would have pursued it in some way. So I just want I just want to set the tone here and thank you. Oh, because I'll happily of, take the credit. <laughs> yeah, because of, of your vision. I know that 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 SWA grew enormously w with your business partners, Hector and and uh, Sergio. And Sergio, how did this idea start? And why did you have this vision of uniting Latinos in Toronto? It's, it's funny that you, you told that story that way because uh, you started with your university experience. And it's funny because that's how it all started for me. And a lot of people don't know this story. But when I first moved to Canada, um, I was very nostalgic back home. 
I never expected that to happen because I've been wanting to go to university abroad ever since I was a child because my sisters went to university abroad. So I never expected that upon arrival, I would have been so nostalgic of back home. But I had an amazing senior year in high school. So I just I had this just yearning for 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 my my culture, what I had experienced in the last few years of high school. And I was lucky to have a lot of Ecuadorians, especially Ecuadorians, but some <laughs> Latinos in, in the University of New Brunswick out of all places. I mean, I showed up one day and I see a couple of the guys that went to my high school and graduated no with way. me. I was like, you guys coming here too? Like what? <laughs> like I had no idea you guys were coming here. And then, so we became friends and, 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 and the group grew larger, just to give you an example or an idea. Uh, by my third year, there were 22 Ecuadorians, 16 what? of which, yeah, 16 of which, uh, of which came from my high school. No way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Was it the was, owner of your insane. high school uh, a shareholder of the University of New Brunswick? <laughs> no, honestly, you know what? We had a, we had a Canadian college counselor. And I mean, it was, it was like a no brainer, honestly, because a lot of people were going to the university in the States. And this guy was like, well, you know, Canada is up here. It's great. Uh, and it's a lot cheaper. cheaper. And there's a lot of like benefits of going to school in Canada. I always knew that I wanted to go to New Brunswick because my sister went to school in New Brunswick. No so way. I already, yeah, I already had my eyes set on that university since I, I actually didn't apply to any other university. I was no. like, that's where I'm getting in and that's where I'm going. Because she had such a good experience. And so, um, so anyways, long story short, um, we were a bunch of Latinos and Gustavo Chavez and I, a good friend Gustavo Chavez, (laughs) when he came to, he's a little bit younger than me, but when he started his first year, we became friends and we started the Latin Undergraduate Association, LUA. (laughs) (laughs) And, And we started actually organizing events and parties. Um, with Jorge Tilen, he was also a DJ back then. It was just who like was also, this mayhem. Who was also there, Paleta, Andres? Yeah, Andres Olaya, Pevan. There was, uh, out of the people you know, Jorge Tilen. Uh, yeah, from, from the people that you know, yeah, I don't think I'm forgetting anybody, but yeah, those okay, guys. Nice. No, th- that, that crew. But there was like way more. A lot of people went back. Um, and did people, did Canadians love Lua in, in New Brunswick? Well, some people, mostly internationals. It was mostly internationals. A lot of people from the Caribbean, like uh, Trinis, a lot of Trinis. Trinis loved like yeah. Latin parties. Um, there Soka. were, yeah, Soca, Calypso. There was, uh, there were some <laughs> Spaniards, <laughs> Spaniards that would came for um, exchange. Um, yeah, just a bunch of like random people would show up. I mean, it was nothing like what, you know what we had here yeah. but but that was the start because when i started organizing those events i remember feeling a feeling that i could never feel when i was working even even like internships that i had or when i was in school yeah. because i was studying I, I was studying engineering and i i remember having this feeling when i organized a couple of these events that i was like this feeling is amazing like bringing all these people together and like showcasing um culture um, so when I came to Toronto, I was, um, I didn't know a lot of Latin people, um, but you know, little by little, I started meeting more Latin people and more Latin people. And we started like hanging out and organizing events. And one day with a bunch of friends, we decided to organize this party because I had a bunch of Mexican friends who didn't dance at all. But this one friend of mine, Monica, she's actually, um, Nico's cousin, I, uh, Nico Galeano, yeah. I don't remember, Fajardo. but anyway. Yeah, so Monica and Julio, Julio is Mexican, and most of our friends were Mexican, but Monica is Colombian, and she wanted to do a dance party, and I wanted to organize a dance party too, because as an Ecuadorian, I wanted to dance, and all these Mexicans didn't dance. So she said, okay, let's organize a, a party, and you bring the music, and we'll make them dance. We'll like, you know, we'll, you will, we'll make it so fun that they will want to dance. And I was like, sure. So I remember going to Best Buy. I bought this 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 set of speakers with the like it was an expensive set of speakers with intention of returning them the next day. <laughs> a very Latino thing to yeah, do. Very Latino thing to do. I was like, I hope nobody spills anything on them because <laughs> they were like eight hundred bucks, and I was like, this this party has to be amazing. <laughs> so I set this whole thing up in the party room. And surprisingly, like a bunch of people heard of this party. I invited Danny, who had just became, uh, had become my roommate, like back then. And he had some friends. And I mean, long story short, 
party ended at one. We got kicked out of the um, out of the um, party room, and then we all went to Monica's place. And we stayed like I stayed until like nine a.m. Like they had gone to bed. They had gone to bed at like four. Like like the the hosts, you know. And then we were just like hanging out there and kept partying until nine a.m. And I remember like standing on a balcony and telling our friends, I was like, we can't like this has to be like there has to be something like this in this city. We can't just look at this energy that we have. Like th- this has to this has to turn into a business. This has to turn into something with that drives more people in a place that is bigger in a place that can gather like Latinos like us who became friends like randomly and then yeah. just expand that community. And that's how that idea was born. A month later or a month and a half later, the first swap, I organized the first swap. And then and eight, eight years later, it evolved into later. An, an incredible business at, that united, I mean, Latinos all around Toronto. Like not to say my wife just told me, yesterday or like two days ago it's like man i fucking she didn't say fucking but she said i wish there was a swat tonight you know like i it's like my body requires swat right now and it's one of those those um moments and, and feelings where every time i walked into swat I just felt like I was the fucking star. And I know a lot of people felt like that. Maybe just me, but a lot of people were, I was just <laughs> walking, like, maybe I wasn't physically doing it, but I was just like arms wide and like, this is my home, you know? Like, I know people here. I can be myself here and I can dance like I'm supposed to dance, not dance salsa to freaking Drake, you know? Because like we feel like a fish out of water in uh, in many environments in Canada. And here it's like, I feel like I'm in Quito. I feel like I'm in Mexico city, in, in Bogota, in, in Medellin, Cartagena, uh, San Salvador, San Jose. So you definitely gave a home to a lot of people. And I bet that through SWA, um, the condom industry went up and, and a lot of babies, a lot of babies were born as well, including mine. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> So listen, it's, you go ahead. No, I was just going to say that it, I, I was never actually thinking of making this like a huge business. It wasn't at the time. It was just like, it's, it's party. Like it just, it just kind of grew out of that. And then once people just like the demand for it, well, like we had to keep changing venues because just more people wanted to come. And I just then at that point realized that, yeah, that there was just so much more like there was a craving for our culture that we we have and this is one of the things that defines me it's like i've realized that latinos we are this huge huge country you know i i see us as a country because when you look at us we're divided by this different like you're from costa rica i'm from ecuador and all these things but when you put us together here i mean we speak a little different but other than that we're probably more similar like all this huge continent we're more similar than we are different in yeah. almost every possible way that you think um so having the opportunity of putting this whole thing together and realizing that it wasn't only me who wanted that but everybody seemed to have like because it wasn't it wasn't only about the party it wasn't only about the music and, and like drinking and like all that it was about feeling like you said feeling at home feeling that you belong feeling that you're in a place where you're just like yeah, you know, like like the cheer song where everybody knows your name, kind of thing. You know, it's it's <laughs> it's it's having that feeling of being home. So yeah, yeah, and and you like you said, we're we're very alike. I mean, there's obviously subtle subtle differences. Like some of us can't pronounce the R in Spanish. Some of you <laughs> eat hamsters for breakfast. Like whatever, <laughs> you know, it's very different but very similar. Now. I find that you are the definition of entrepreneurship, man, resilience and adaptability. So over the years you studied, over the years, so basically you're an engineer, worked in construction management, then quit to do an incredible event production company along with Diego and uh, along with Hector and, and Sergio. Over the years, you studied marketing, graphic design, you went back to work, then you continued to grow SWAL, your event production business and did many incredible things, then the pandemic hit. Now you continue to pivot. You're an incredible content creator with disruptive consensus on YouTube. And I think that 
you're so good at what you do because you're a hundred percent committed to your projects and you're super passionate. So I think as an entrepreneur, sometimes it's very hard to let go to start something new because everything is like our little baby. That's so right. what challenges and insights have you found along the way as you've shifted projects and careers? I don't know. I think um, for me, probably one of the biggest realizations was like just the way I spend my time. Like it all comes down to the little things. I, I remember used to being at the office and just not really feeling that what I was doing on a day to day basis, like that's how it all started for me. Like I, I didn't feel like what I was doing on a day to day basis was meaningful at all. I felt like I, I could be doing so much more than what I'm doing now, like filling all these checklists and like, <laughs> you know, like attending all these meetings that I, you know, it was, yeah, it was interesting and all that, but it's more like, it, it has this grandiose thing about it where you have a career and where you can be in 20 years and all that kind of stuff. I was like, I care about now. What am I doing today? What am I learning now? It all started like that. When I was doing events, when I was organizing my events, I was feeling this thrill of like excitement, um, anxiety, not knowing whether it was going to be good or bad, not knowing if I, you know, if, if there was going to be some problem with it. I like, there were so many unknowns. And at the end of the night, when everything went well, it was so rewarding. And when it didn't go that yeah. well, yeah, fulfilling. And when it didn't go that well, I had this urge to try it again and then try something different. And how can I make it better? I never felt like that at work. Um, and I know that everybody has different experiences with their, with their you know, day jobs or with their careers, but that was my experience. I, what I was were like, you doing? What were you doing in your first job as an engineer in construction management? Yeah, I, and that's the other thing. I was part of probably the most exciting project in the country. I was building the, the, the only subway being built in Canada at the time. It's actually next to your place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, Downsview Park. That subway line, yeah. That subway line, that's where I was working. Not only that, I, I, I was able to get my best friend from university an interview uh, with the company and he got the job and they, and they put him in my same project. We were sharing an office. Like, what? you know, it Who's was this? great in that. Uh, his name is Nathan Poncho. We call him Poncho. Oh yeah, I met him. He slept on my couch a bunch of times. Yeah, he slept <laughs> on your couch. That's right, Poncho. <laughs> He's awesome. He, uh, he was, he was like, we were sharing an office. My boss, he was awesome. Like all my coworkers were great. Like everything about this job was awesome. But I mean, they, like, I didn't really feel challenged. I didn't really feel that I was using my engineering skills very much. It was a lot of like contractual stuff. And like, like I said, like just feeling checklists and, you know, like I, maybe it was because I wasn't really born to do this kind of work. I, I, I've always had this more creative drive and I just sort of like, I was able to, to come to terms with that reality a bit later in my life after I had gone to school. So, so even though everything about the job was exciting and, and, and interesting and any engineer, any young engineer would have killed for that opportunity. I, I was just like, at the end of the day, I just came home and I was like, you know, like I, yeah, that was an okay day, right? Where so 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 I like after a couple of years or almost three years of doing that, I was like, yeah, no. Especially when I started doing SWA and I could compare the two feelings, I was like, I need to invest. Like when you're in a, when you're young, and here's one of the insights that I've learned: you got to take risks when you don't have anything to lose. Yeah. When you're young, you have very little to lose. You know, like you might, you know. <laughs> I, when I when I quit my job, I had to drive a little bus with a bunch of children just to like make ends meet, you know, like and I would do that on the off hours of my day. You know, I, I, I worked at this like really random like school for like Chinese students. They wanted to start bringing Mexican students. So they hired me like it was just like this really random jobs here and there like <laughs> as a server, bartender, all these kinds of things, just so that I could dedicate my most of my time to what I wanted to do, to what I was like actually driven to do. Um, but that's okay because when you're young, that's, that's, that's when you take those chances. You don't wait until you're 40 and you're hit like a midlife crisis and you're like, I hate what I do. And <laughs> at that point in time, you have a family and you have all these responsibilities. A mortgage. 
a mortgage and all these kinds of things. When you're young, is time to to take risks. So, so I did, and I've done ever since. Um, keep taking risks, and and uh, you know, I still feel that I'm young, although <laughs> <Me> <laughs> obviously too. not as young. Me, me but too. So we both we both quit our jobs to do what we love. So you your first time in construction management and and me my first time and, and only time for right now is um in wealth management i was at the bank and in my opinion the first time of quitting is the scariest one now i remember i was super scared of disappointing my parents what will my latino family say what will my my latino friends say back home because they don't they can't see me here and it's hard to put into words what I'm feeling and accomplishing because they haven't felt it, you know, they haven't been there. So do you remember the decision-making process when you decided to quit your job at, 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 in construction management the first time? Do you remember any fears? Man, that's the funniest thing. I was so ignorant. I was so like, <laughs> he, here's, here's, the, here's the big, 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 um, like, I have to admit this because this is the, the truth. I was privileged. I yeah. was privileged I, up until then. My parents had paid for my university. Same. And then after that, when I finished, I, I started working and I had a salary and I was, you know, I had a good, an okay salary, but, but it was, but it was fine. I was able to survive perfectly fine and save yeah. money and all that. I didn't save much back then, but, but you know, it was okay. And then all of a sudden I quit and I had never actually been on my own. So I thought, oh, you know, I'll, I'll ask my parents, you know, they'll probably help me until I find, you know, I get up on my feet. I called my mom that day. I didn't really think about it. when I went to my boss's office to quit. I was like, hey, I quit, basically. He was like, what? <laughs> but but everything's great. Like, we love you, man. Why are you quitting? And I was like, yeah, this is not my thing. <laughs> it was a Friday night. He was like, are you sure you don't want to go up for a beer and talk about it? And I was like. I love the beer, but I made my choice. And he was like, <laughs> okay. So I remember I was so excited. I was driving back home and I was like, I quit and all this thing, you know. I get home and I call my mom and I tell her. And she's like, you did what? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I quit. You know, like I have this business now and that I'm all. And she's like, how the hell are you going to survive? Like, how are you going to pay your bills? And I was like, well, you know, I mean, this gives me something and then you can help me with the rest. And she's like, no, I don't help you with anything. Like you're on your own, man. Like you made this choice. You have two, op you have two options. You have to go back on Monday and ask for your job back or you figure out a way that you're going to survive. And I was like, I was like, okay. You know, I was like, I felt like really like all of a sudden, like this whole like weight just fell on oh, my yeah. shoulders. I was so naive, man. I was so naive. So what did I do? Back on Monday, I went asking for my job back. That's what I did. And my boss, <laughs> and my boss, he's like, uh, yeah, I already emailed head office, man. I can't do anything about it. I mean, I wish I could help you, but I, I just like literally like this is, I can't go back, you know? And, and I was like, shit. So that's the reality started to sink in. I didn't have a lot of savings. I was like, what am I going to do? How am I going to pay for my car for my rent all these things you know like i had like a month to survive at most and so that's when i got this job like driving the bus and all these things <laughs> <laughs> that's that's incredible i remember because at the time i used to i used to do like all the pre-parties all the pre-drinks at my place and all the after parties and uh, i helped you organize and bring a lot of people to, to the parties at the beginning and yeah. And some like you would have a lot of stress before the party. Yeah. And I didn't think about it at the time because I'm privileged too. Like my parents paid for everything, my university. Now I did plan six months ahead and saved up a lot of money before I quit. So that yeah. gave me some some peace, a lot of peace of mind, obviously. Um, but um now that I think about it, I'm like, well, obviously this guy had to pay everything. And I'm like, I knew that you had to make money to pay because you had quit your job because we were close friends, obviously. But I didn't understand what it meant because I had never quit my job and I had a really good salary. I was just chilling, partying, traveling, you know, but now now I get it. It's it's hard, man. Now it is hard. And, and here's the thing, too. Um, it was the biggest lesson out of everything that I learned. That was probably the biggest lesson because it actually teaches you to face life like 
maybe if I had never done that, who knows if I had ever learned the lesson of, 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 of being able to, you know, to sustain myself and what life is actually all about and, and having this fear of actually losing what you have um, and, and having to, I don't know, having to go back to your country maybe because you didn't make it up here. Like yeah. all these fears that, that, that I remember having and that I still do. I mean, they're still present whenever I take a risk. But like, like you did now, I plan. I learned to do that because life hit me in the face with a hammer, right? Like, so, <laughs> man, it was, it, was, it was a good, like, tough three, four years after I quit. I was like, I had to, you know, I had to go back to work eventually just to save money so that I could quit properly like you did. And, yeah. like, like, the story is long, but, um, but yeah, but the lesson was, the lesson, I'll never forget that. And, and, and that's, yeah. that's something very important in my life. When the pandemic hit, I remember we had a talk and, and we had a talk with, with a bunch of our friends and on Zoom and we were just connecting. And in my ever positive outlook of life, I was like, guys, don't worry, man. Like, we'll be back doing shows in a month. This will be good. And I remember you being like, dude, this is going to be a while. Like, I'm not just talking like a couple months. Like, it'll be a lot more. And I remember he... You used this phrase in Spanish, obviously, but you said, life as we know it. <laughs> <laughs> life as we know it will never be the same. And I'm like, are we in a fucking Matrix movie? What's going on? <laughs> loco, loco. And I'm like, well, I guess we're, we're going to have to wait it out and see and see what happens. And and you were right man <laughs> it's been a year we're fucking in our homes like we couldn't even meet today to do this podcast in person so the other day i read one of your articles and, and mm -hmm. listened to your videos and you said that society will continue to change and even more than that it has changed up to till today so do you think we're we're ready and how can we adapt for these upcoming changes well, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put out all these messages about uh, how we should kind of look at life from this adaptability point of view, from uh, from an optimistic view of the future point of, point of view, but by understanding the reality. I, here's the thing. I think that there's some important changes, how we work, how we learn, um, how we do business. I mean, look at just give you an example. I have one of those penguin pickup places right near my place. What's a um, penguin one, pickup place? So it's a place where you order stuff and then you pick it up from there, right? So mm -hmm. like okay. anything from like Walmart or like big deliveries and stuff. I remember I used to walk by it all the time and I was like, I wonder how these guys survive. I never see anyone there. That was before the pandemic. And I was just like, now, man, there's lineups like for like the, the entire block, people just lining up to get their no stuff way. that they order online. And I mean, you got to keep in mind that a lot of people do have concierges and that they can order directly to their yeah. homes. But in spite of that, there's so, so much demand. And e-commerce only, e-commerce e only represents about 15% of how people like of, of retail, you know, um, I think it represented be, below 10% before the pandemic hit and it has grown about 10 or 15% in the last year. And look at this now, like it's crazy. Um, a lot of things are going to change. Um, and, and yeah, and the, the world, people became open to doing business in a different way, to ordering things online, to not having to waste time going to, to stores. That is probably not going to come back because people don't miss that experience. Maybe going to a place where like, I don't know, like, like a really cool mall where you have a lot of things and there's an experience about it, that might sort of come back. But most retail stores that are just big box stores where you have like, you know, there's no experience to that. That's probably not gonna come. That's probably not gonna come back. So people are gonna have to start adapting to the reality that this this is sort of like an like like evidence that the world changes really really fast. And if you yeah. don't, if you're not capable of adapting, there's other changes that are gonna be coming. Like AI is coming, and a bunch of other uh, things that what are is gonna AI. Uh, Alan Iverson? <laughs> Artificial intelligence will replace <laughs> a lot of things that we do and a lot of jobs will get automated. People probably, people are not thinking about these things today. But the thing is that 
in five years, technology grows exponentially and people yeah. just stay at their jobs and, and their growth is a lot slower. So if they're not prepared to face these realities, they'll, they'll encounter a very tough outlook, like facing the future. You know, we, we are not used to planning our lives like 30 years down the road, but we all have to retire eventually. We all have to be old and pay bills when we're old. People don't think about these things, but we'll have to do that. And if we're not ready to, be, to continue to be relevant, as technology improves, as the world changes, then I don't know. I, I think people are just going to have to, are, are going to face tough times. Here's two things that I've learned from the pandemic to your point. The first one is I agree that a lot of these stores will not survive, obviously because they haven't sold in the last year, a lot of them, but mostly because I used to be the guy who always wanted to go in person. Me too. You know me, you know me we're, I want to be best friends with everyone. I, I want to say hi to everyone, talk to everyone, experience the store, even suggest things that they can improve in the store. I like, I want to help them sell more in the two minutes that I'm there. So I love that. But I thought that I wouldn't necessarily enjoy the online experience. And you know what? I don't. But now I convince myself that it's possible to buy things successfully online. Exactly. And the second thing that I enjoy the most is that now I can stop doing the things that I hate, like going to the supermarket. Right. Automate that. And use that time allocated to what I do best and what I love doing more and my money maker, which is let's say doing corporate comedy shows, prospecting, following up with people, or just take it to the other extreme, doing things that I love that don't make me money, but are still productive, like reading, running, uh, like exercising, listening to podcasts, watching TV, spending time with my wife and son. And now I don't have to go to the super. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. And I think a lot of us, we're in the age that it's easy for us to adapt in some ways, but my mom, she's 63, I think. And she's also convinced herself that she can do a lot of things online. So I don't think, like you said, we'll ever go back to where we were. Now, do you have an example? I I really love what you said about artificial intelligence what other things do you think will be automated and a couple of jobs that we may not see again like obviously like the supermarkets like the self-serve stuff um or like do you do you say more in banks like online banking or little things what jobs will be replaced do you think i mean here's here's what i'll say i i mean it's it's hard to say what will be replaced i mean there's some things that are that are very known that are going to be replaced like for example driving you know, truck drivers, drivers in general, because uh, autonomous vehicles are coming probably in the next five years. And they're in the States, for example, being a truck driver is one of the most common jobs in like half of the states, half of the like half of the wow. not half of the states as a country, but half of the individual states. The most common job is being a driver. So imagine how many people are going to be displaced by that technology. But but even even the most um the things that people don't realize. For example, when I was an engineer, there was a lot of jobs that were created because we were not efficient at doing things, you know? So so you need to hire more people to take care of like coordination and handling contracts Mm -hmm. and handling all these little things. And this is the kind of thing that I think will get replaced as things become more efficient because you like, you realize when you're doing this work that what you're doing is not that valuable. And that also sort of like answers where you were asking before, what can people do to adapt? Just make sure that what you're doing is valuable. Like that what your work on a day-to-day basis is valuable to society. Now, if you're sitting in an office and you're doing a lot of stuff that you, that you think is sort of like bullshit, you know, then you know, you have to ask yourself this question is like, how much longer can I survive doing this before someone realizes that I'm not really required before someone, you know, creates some sort of efficient method that will, that will just make me irrelevant in this organization. And in that point in time, plan, plan, save money, make sure that you have enough money to to face a time of learning, a time of adaptability, a time of growth so that you can that you can, like you said, that that you can make these kinds of decisions like quitting your job or trying a new career, 
with peace of mind because that's yeah. that's important if you're stressed all the time you won't be able to focus on the important things for your personal growth right so you have to make this it's also hard to be it's also be it's also hard to be creative and learn if you're super stressed absolutely you, you need that mental mental clarity to be able to 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 concentrate on 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 growing as a as a professional as a person as everything right so so yeah absolutely i think that um that that's one of the most important things people can do that's how we can adapt um people need to ask this themselves these questions it's not because you have a job and a salary means that you're secure not because yeah. you have a degree means you're secure the world changes really fast at the end of the day people pay money for other people to solve problems they don't just throw money away for for, for no reason so if someone can come along and solve the same problem you're solving now in a much more efficient way then you know your 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 days are counted you have to start to realize yeah. how you can bring value to the world and that is That is the key thing. You have to understand how to bring value to the world, do you whether think that's through a business or, or a skill. Yeah. Do you think it's easier to be productive or really good at something if the job is aligned with your core values? For example, do you think you'll be replaced or you'll do a shittier job if you're like a, I don't know, like a lobbyist and you fucking hate your job? So you'll tend to do it worse or do you or like, for example, you're a lawyer and you're lobbying or, or uh, doing cases against the indigenous peoples or like for oil and gas or whatever. And that goes against your principles or your core values. Mm -hmm. Do you think over the course of time, you're going to start doing a shittier job or you'll feel like this, like unmotivated? So basically, do you think it's better to do a job in line with your core values, which you enjoy, and maybe along the, like over the course of time, you'll do it better, you'll be more effective and efficient, and will be it'll be super harder to replace you. Yeah, and 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 there's a simple answer to that, and it's that you'll never realize your potential if you don't. Because here's the thing, like I think that the human brain, the human mind's biggest capacity is creating ideas. And ideas flourish when you're inspired, when you're motivated, when you're happy, when you're thinking outside of the time. Like, say you go for a walk or you're taking a shower and your your mind is racing. You have all these ideas that you want to implement. If you don't like what you're doing, you're not going to be thinking about that. Yeah. And so what you're going to be doing is you're going to be thinking about things that 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 make you feel excited, that that you look forward to. And then you're going to go to your job. And so <laughs> all those moments where you could have been creating things, thinking about new ideas and, and, and realizing your potential as an individual, as, a, as an idea creator, because that's what our minds do all the time. Then if you don't if you don't have a job where you can realize that, then you're always going to be limited. Maybe you're talented. Maybe you maybe I don't know, maybe you have something that other people don't or some education and you're okay with your job, but you'll never be that successful as you could be doing something that really, really excites you, that really motivates you and inspires you because that will make ideas flourish. And when you have new ideas, new ideas are the biggest source of value that you can bring to the world. Um, creative ideas, everything that you put out on the internet that you put out when you do your shows and comedy, That's yeah. the biggest source of value that you're bringing to the world because no one else other than you is putting that exact same content or that exact same idea or that exact same line or presentation or whatever or or perspective when you're giving a class or anything. You're being unique and original because that's what the human brain is. So that's exactly why I think you would never be as successful if you hate your job. Yeah. And I totally agree with what you said with what you said because when I was in university studying commerce and finance, which by the way, I just want to leave it out there. I always say this. I'm not against the corporate life. I used to be in some ways, Me especially neither. when I quit. And and I I don't miss the nine to five. I definitely miss the uh, consistent paycheck, even if I worked or didn't work. But um I'll say this. I'm very grateful for my seven years at Scotiabank in wealth because it allowed me to be an even better entrepreneur now and better businessman, negotiator, marketer, everything. Absolutely. But that being said, when I was in university studying finance, which I liked, I was always thinking about jokes. I was writing sketches. I was writing ideas and I couldn't stop thinking about them. 
And I, I would just every in the note, like the last page of all my notebooks, I would just write ideas, write ideas. And then one page, two, two, like I had that. I just bought a notebook for ideas because I couldn't stop thinking about them. And at the bank, I was also thinking about doing videos. And I met you when I was in my Vine, um, Vine, Vine base. And yeah. I was just like endless ideas. And then, and then that should tell you self-awareness that maybe you should pursue whatever you're thinking about all day. And I don't mean like, oh, you have to quit your job today. Ah, fuck the world. No, chill. Like, think about it. You can do it part-time at the beginning, read books, join a couple of courses, and then you can start to see how it goes. Because like sometimes the grass is greener on the other side. Like maybe I'm like, no, I want to be a professional uh, swimmer, like a, a, a skier or whatever. And then I do it and then I don't like it. Like sometimes you think that you'll like it. So that's why it's good to, to not go zero to a hundred. Just take the first steps and evaluate it. But here's the thing. Um, when you follow that, whatever it, it may be, say, say it's the swimmer example. Like if you never, if you never, if you never follow that curiosity of wanting yeah. to do that, you'll never know what's on the other side because yeah, you might do it and you realize that you didn't like it as much. But I'm sure that on that transition, you'll discover something else. Because as you yeah. start, like, it's like as you start opening doors, you'll find new ones and new ones and new ones that will take you to your to your path. Right. Yeah. But if you if you never take that risk, if you only remain in that like box. Right. Yeah. Thinking like, yeah, I have a salary. I'm OK. I like what I'm doing. I don't there's no need for me to like switch. Here's the thing that I this, this is what I think at the end of the day you're going to spend your entire life. You only have one of those. <laughs> you only have one of those. You'll spend your entire life doing that. And yeah, you might be okay, you know, paycheck at the end of the month. And if that's the life you want to live, answer that question to, to yourself today. Is this what I want? Like by the time that I'm hopefully 80 or 90 years old and, and, and you know, my life is over and I can look back and say, yeah, this is what I wanted to live. I'm okay with that decision. Perfect. You might have never realized your potential, but that, but that was your choice and you made that choice consciously. But if you don't feel excited by that, by, by that idea, if you think that at one point in time you might regret never realizing what you're actually capable of doing, then start trying. Don't like you might not find that answer right away. It might take yeah. you a while. You know, I started with parties. Now, parties, I, I never thought that I was going to want, like that I wanted to do parties for the rest of my life. That was never my goal, but I knew that I wanted to do parties way more than I wanted to do engineering. I wanted to do something that was mine. I wanted to bring my little piece of creativity to the world. Yeah. At that point in time, it was parties. So I did that. What I'm and that took me to design. And then I started yeah. doing design and writing and content creation. And now I'm where I am now, <laughs> but it was a process. Getting yeah, there. yeah. What I'm trying to say is that I don't want it to set, because here's the thing. A lot of people, when they hear my story, at least, and probably your story, is that, wow, this fucking guy woke up one day and was like, fuck these fuckers at the bank. I'm going to be a comedian. I walked <laughs> out of my house. Now I'm on Comedy Central. No, it's not like that. It wasn't of course like, it's that. Not like that. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is that, Set yourself up for success because if this is if you if you think that Jim Carrey, in my case of the comedy, one day woke up and was that funny, it's super discouraging because right now you're not that funny. And now when I look back four years ago when I quit my job, I'm like, I used to fucking suck at comedy. And and it's okay because I was better than like four years ago, I was better than six years ago. That's right. And, and yeah. seven years ago. So what I'm trying to say is that for it to not sound that overwhelming because it sounds glamorous. Oh, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to, and then when you're like, Oh fuck, what did I do? It's not as glamorous. So you don't have to jump off the cliff. Obviously if you jump off, like we did, you're going to learn a lot of things on the way, but here's the thing. Some people say, Oh no, experience is the biggest teacher. Like you learn how to be the best comedian on stage because failing and experience is the best teacher. Yeah. It's the best teacher, but it's also costly. So here's the thing. If, if I had not taken courses, read a bunch of books and do, done comedy on the side for three years before I quit my job, uh, fun fact, Diego and Hector with Latin Live gave me my first chance at comedy. If I hadn't done it on the side for three years, I would not be doing it full-time today. 
That's See, right. because I learned along the way. So uh, it's costly. So if I, basically, if I can take, if I quit with no comedy experience, I quit the bank. Let's say just an example and make it to Netflix, having my own comedy special on Netflix. If, if I quit with no comedy experience, maybe it would take me 15 years. But if I read books, take workshops, uh, like practice on the side, do it and do other things than just experience, which is supposedly the best teacher, it might take me six years. So what, what I'm trying to say is, yes, jump off the cliff if you want, but it doesn't have to be that painful. You can plan ahead. It doesn't have, yeah. You can plan it ahead, doesn't you have can to take be that courses, painful. and you can try it a little bit. So the opportunity cost is a little less. Also, if you can start making money on the side before you quit, that's even better. So that's, that, that's when better. the planning comes in. Yeah, here, here's my insight when it comes to that. I mean, everybody will have their sort of like road because it'll depend on, it'll depend on what you do, how expensive it is, what you're trying to do. Um, everybody will have different um, paths. But yeah. here's like, for example, I could, I could just say, I, I can say the exact same thing and say, well, if you quit, you'll be able to dedicate more time to your art instead of and, and reading books and all those things that you're and preparing yourself. Um, and so you'll be able to get to that place faster, but you might have to change your lifestyle. Maybe you can't live in a $2,000 uh, a month apartment anymore. You'll have to move to a place that is $1,000 and you won't be able to spend your money in, I don't know, like going out for dinner and all these kinds of yeah. things. You might have to do, you know, like there's different paths. Some people might want to do whatever they do full time because their time is the most precious thing that they have. So people like you might want to plan ahead and just start like, you know, dipping their toes in the water and saying, okay, do I like that? Yeah. You know, that book resonated with me. I tried the show the other day and that was good. I took a course with Mar Pensando and it turns out that I really like comedy and I'm really good at it. Right. There's different paths. Yeah. It just depends you that you have to figure out in your own. And yeah. you have to measure how much risk you're willing to take. Yeah. Nobody, nobody can tell you what's the right, like what's the right formula. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, you'll have to figure out what formula you want to try on your own. And hey, if you save a ton of money, you know, if you're really good at saving and you don't spend your money, you might be able to do that a lot sooner. And you might be able to quit a lot sooner. And you might be able to buy yourself five years of your time so that you can invest those five years on your personal growth and education. But it all depends yeah. how, you, how you sort of like face life before, before sort of like going after your dreams. Kind of I thing. think I, I totally agree. And, and I think it depends on how you want to live your life. Like you just said, because Absolutely. you and I, which I learned a lot from you of saving and, and, and lowering my my standard of living to, 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 to like I moved like you to a cheaper place I stopped going to restaurants I stopped eating out I stopped drinking outside like at restaurants I stopped using uber mm -hmm. and I stopped like traveling and at the at first like because all my friends were traveling spending partying like to me going out to a restaurant and like spending for myself 70 dollars was like whatever I did it all the time like like a bunch of times a month a week because I made a lot of money and I had no response, like apart from paying rent and eating. Right. So, uh, but what I'm trying to say is in my, in my example, I had, I gave myself one year and even though I did lower all my expenses, I was like, fuck man. I, I, I don't want to be one of those guys that, and no, no offense. Like I don't want to work at Tim Hortons or I don't want to, I don't want to be like cleaning floors and, and no problem because I've done survival jobs. It's fine. But I said, I'm going to give myself one year and I don't want to be like 13 years, like suffering to just make it, you know? Um, so in, in my example, I, I wanted to live an okay life that I was used to. And I wanted to see if I was good. So because I'm a planner, like you said, everyone has their own journey. I found out what I what worked for me and, and to me, just to give me a peace of mind, I planned ahead significantly, not just like financially and lowering my expenses, but I also took a lot of courses and made sure that I failed quickly 
in those first three years so that the transition wouldn't be as tough. And I also prepared myself mentally and emotionally. I started meditating to help with my anxiety. I started reading and learning from high performers so that the transition would be a lot more successful. But here's my question to you. that When you were doing all those things, were you planning, was, was that all your journey to the day that you were going to quit? Like, was that your plan? Or as you were doing all those things, did you just decide at one point in time, okay, I'm going to quit? You know, like... I, I, planned my, I planned quitting six months in advance. I quit in, in April, advance. April 2017, just like with the exact days I needed to fulfill my permanent residence to apply for citizenship. Even though I didn't right. need the Scotia job to be able to apply, but uh, so I quit in six months before September of 2016, I spoke to my, my wife, then girlfriend, and I was like, would you support me? And Huang and I, like, you know, my business partner, Huang, we would quit right. together. But I, I, I had those six months, obviously, as things were moving forward. And when I quit in the first year, it's evolved incre incredibly. We thought that we would live off of comedy shows. And the comedy shows were like the least percentage of our gross income. The school was what grew up, what, what grew the, and what evolved in the bulk. Now we teach and we do corporate workshops and corporate comedy shows. And that's, and, and that's one thing that you're forced to do also because you now have to face the reality that you have to live off of this 100% of the time. Yeah. Also, you have all these new ideas that are flourishing and you have the time to execute them. So I totally agree with you. You got to be smart about it. You got to understand self-awareness. Go back to that, right? You got to understand your life. You might be wealthy and you don't have to worry about this. Perfect. Then you can take those chances and it's going to be easier for you. Yeah. Or maybe you're in a tough situation. You have a tough family situation. Maybe you have um, a lot of bills to pay or maybe you're in debt. Maybe all these kinds of things. You have to be self-aware of where you are before you make this decision so that you don't shoot yourself in the foot. And then yeah. you're thinking like, I shouldn't have done that. Like I did. Maybe I needed to do it because I needed to learn, <laughs> but I'm, I don't recommend what I did to anyone at all because what I did just basically what that, that set me back maybe four years because if I would have remained working and I would have planned like you did, I would have saved, I would have, then I would have been able to grow the company a lot faster, would have been able to take more risks with SWA and, yeah. and, and all these kinds of things, right? So, so that's what I did this time around, you know? Um, I want to... I want to talk about disruptive consensus, which I absolutely love. And I'm going to read this because I don't want to mess this up. So disruptive sure. consensus is a YouTube channel and blog that creates inspiring, entertaining and educational essay, essay style content in video, audio and text about ideas to address the current challenges facing society and the individual in order to foster an optimistic vision for the future. And I tell you, these videos are fucking good because I always leave these videos like, man, I need to do something right now. I like, I, like I'm going to recycle something that I need right now. I just want to do something for the planet, for myself to be more mindful, present. And I love that there's always like a call to action. And one of the ones that I love the most is that you said that it's so ironic that in the era of information, we're all, and we're all so connected because we have the phones, computers, everything. We're so like misinformed, like ill-informed, semi-informed. We don't know what's true, what's false. The other day I learned that Google will give you different suggested results depending on where you live. So where do you think we'll get the news in the next 50 years? How will it evolve? And how will we be able to distinguish what's truth from what's false? That's that's a very interesting question because that's at the core of what we do. Uh, we see this media landscape changing. I'll give you a great example. Look at what's happening in the United States with, with, uh, with the censorship of Trump. That all has to do, that all ties together. The media has been pushing and pushing and pushing this narrative for Trump, giving him airtime before he was president, that made him president. And during his presidency, they cover everything he says. Why? Because they're desperate for attention. Why? Because people are migrating outside of the normal, like mainstream media environment. People are not consuming CNN as they d used to do that before. Like Joe Rogan, uh, I, I, a guy that I listened to um, 
like several times a week, he has a bigger audience than most mainstream media shows on cable news in the United States. Um, and he just he just started like you, just talking to his friends, talking to people that he knows and having interesting, in-depth conversations about life, about their careers, about interesting ideas, wherever the conversation might go. And people and in a time where everybody thought that people only had like these really short attention spans and they were only capable of like paying attention to a short like um, one minute clip, he proved that people have this craving for like a three hour podcast. It's insane. Right? While, while, while all this like mainstream media is so busy trying to get ratings up, this guy was just like talking to people. And so that goes to show you that there's a, there's a changing media landscape. People are changing the way they consume media, right? So obviously that's created a lot. Like when you grow, when things change, there's growing pains, there's changes. One of the things that suffer was the truth. All these algorithms and all these things that the social media companies, and if, if, if you guys haven't seen um, The Social Dilemma, the documentary, I strongly recommend it because it's- Which one? It, 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 the Social Dilemma. Oh yeah. I don't know yeah, if you've I seen it on, on Netflix. Really good. Yeah. It's an amazing documentary. It sort of shows you what happens in social media and how the algorithms work and how they feed you the information that, you know, that they'll know or that they predict that will attract you to stay on the platform for longer, right? So this is a whole different environment than what it used to be where people would just like show content. It was only unidirectional because people didn't understand how the viewer was feeling about it. Now, you know how the viewer is feeling about it. If he clicks away or if he's not paying attention to the video and he cuts it halfway... Right. So you can target viewers by their interests, confirming their biases. And then misinformation starts to flourish because people who, you know, may like A will get a video that confirms A and then another thing that confirms A and another and another and yeah. another. And then they go in this spiral of information on one side. And when they're presented an alternative view, which might be the truth, they won't believe it. Right. You start to polarize people into these factions. So now I, I wrote this article about it, that this uh, the ban on Twitter, um, the, well, on social media of Trump and Parler, this, this big um, social media platform that has been growing in the United States, uh, banned by Amazon Web Services and uh, Apple and Google on, the, on, the, on their Play Store so and Apple to, Store. Just to give context from what I understand is that when Trump was banned from Twitter and other, other social media companies, then he was communicating via Parler, which is another app where most mm -hmm. of his followers went or were already there. And that Parler belonged to Amazon? And no. They so Parler, Parler is basically, Parler is another, is the, a, a, a competitor of Facebook. It's an alternative okay. social media platform um, that, you know, albeit, you know, it has uh, a lot of like right wing people, people on it. Um, but it's not particularly targeted to the right wing or anything like that. It's okay. just that a lot of right wing people have taken, you know, they, they started to use this platform because it has more freedom than Twitter and then Facebook will censor you less and all this kind of stuff. Um, anyways, Amazon Web Services that hosts that platform, okay. upon what happened on January 6th at the Capitol, they just decided in a matter of hours, just decided you're out. You know, we don't want to do business with you anymore. Essentially, essentially being a, like taking it off the internet because they, they, they couldn't host their, their, wow. their entire platform. This, this is 10 million users, okay? <laughs> 10 million users like this. And then Apple and Google took it out of the Apple store and took it out of the, the Play store respectively. Um, so all of a sudden this, this company, and I've heard a lot of inter in interviews, the CEO is, is very interesting. And by the way, I, I don't have to agree with the guy or agree with the people on the platform to understand that it is dangerous when one company or a few companies have the power of censoring 10 million people's 10 million people's views and 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 activity online like this the point of the story is that inevitably all these things that happen in the past few weeks are forcing this conversation of people people are starting to realize that we can no longer escape this debate of how we consume media, what's right, what's wrong, what should be allowed, what shouldn't be allowed, what, what's freedom of, of speech and how far it goes, how much power these social media companies have. 
all these conversations are happening now as a result, which is very important. We have to have these conversations. We can no longer procrastinate on these issues. As disruptive consensus, one of our like core values is to be able to inform people of sort of like healthy information. We don't want to inflame things. We don't want to get people's attention so that they get worried or that they get like, um, like it happens with, with other media organizations that are constantly trying to get your attention by talking about the things that are controversial, the things that, are, that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. attack sort of like things that you hate or the things that you love, right? So that you're like more engaged and more like entertained rather than informed, right? So this is gonna force a huge change in the media landscape. And so it's- what can it's, we do? What can, like, so for example, me, I yeah. value being present and being mindful. And, and the other day I, I taught a course on, on productivity and I don't mean like doing more in less time. I mean, freeing up time for what matters. And so what right. I've done is deleting apps from my phone so that whenever I need to access them, I'll do it on the computer with intentionality. That way I'm not wasting time. So I've deleted Twitter, Snapchat, LinkedIn, Facebook, and I don't remember which other. So I've just kept Instagram and, 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 and WhatsApp. And, and basically now I go on and as you know me, I'm not very controversial. Like I, I don't feel like I'm even a tenth in, as informed as you in politics. So, for people like me who consider themselves like apolitical and I don't want to deal with this controversy, how can we contribute to the truth? And what can we do to not favor? I don't know if it's capitalism or the or falseness or like like. Uh, the yellow, how do you say, like amarillismo? How, what can yeah, you do? Like inflammatory information. Here's, here's what you do. I, th I think that's a great question. I'm really glad you asked that because this is what I would suggest people to do. Definitely, you, you can't just afford to ignore it. A lot of people will say, yeah, I don't care about that. People can fight it off on the internet. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make my life miserable by watching CNN all day. And I don't care yeah. what these people say on Twitter and you ignore it. Here's what happens if you ignore it. If you ignore it, you're giving them the keys of the of the car to drive the conversation that's actually taking our society into this very dangerous place. You can't afford to ignore it because if you do, you're basically letting these people who are very, very active on the media, yeah. on social media, online, polarizing other people, you're giving you're giving them the option of hijacking the debate, the political debate that is now the main driver of policy that will affect your life, right? So you might not be paying attention for months, maybe only when something really, really big happens. And when it does, you don't have an informed opinion about it because you haven't been paying attention to the issue. What happens is that the politicians that make the decisions, the media that decides to cover this will do so based on the people who are active, who are yeah. talking, who are pushing for the narrative. And so we can't allow this conversation to be hijacked by the extremes, which has been happening for the past few years. What I suggest people do is that if you don't have time to be informed, it's fine. If you don't have the drive of wanting to learn about these things, that is fine. But there is a lot of people out there that are investing their time in like writing articles, books, and reading things and making like in debating things. What I do is I outsource that to the people that I trust. I develop this trust relationship. So for example, Joe Rogan is a great, great uh, source of information for me. Why? Because I trust him. He has earned my trust. After watching his show for years now, I've, I've developed some trust relationship with him because I can see who he is. I, I get to know the person after watching so many hours of, of him talking to other people. You develop this trust relationship. You know that this person is constantly talking to people who are informed, who are interesting. He's bringing people from all sides of the political spectrum. So now you can outsource that, like um, you can outsource your, your search for information, if you may, to people like that. I also do it with Sam Harris. I really like Sam Harris. So I've, 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 um, I've listened to a bunch of his talks and debates and all these kinds of things. I listen to his podcast yeah. every week. So I develop a trust relationship. What he says makes sense to me. And I try to do that with a bunch of people that are all across the political spectrum so that you, after, after listening to people that are more informed than you and outsourcing that sort of like search for information to these people who are doing it all the time, 
then you get to make up your own mind based on all that you hear. Yeah. And the idea is to do it from a huge variety of people, men, women, people from different countries, from different religions and, and different ideologies. Like try not to be siloed into only your way of thinking. Yeah. And in it's my opinion, that's the best. Sorry? Yeah, it's, uh, it's very complicated because in some ways, some people could say, well, obviously Joe Rogan and Sam Harris confirm your biases of life and your outlook on life. That's why, and then some people might listen to very right-wing people, but I agree, we have to listen to many people on different sides of the political spectrum with different opinions so that we can make our own opinion on, on things. Yeah, you well, make your own opinion. That's, that's, well, that's the whole point, yeah. Going, Go back to, going back to the social media thing and, and me uh, um, avoiding these inflammatory news and comments and people fighting, I hate fighting on social media. This is how I see it. If I go and comment on these people's posts, they'll get even more views and more uh, engagement. So this is how I see it. And obviously it's in my ever positive outlook of life. And I post, like I'll take my real estate of the, the grand scale of all the millions of things being post, posted, but I'll post with positive messages and great things that are happening to take away attention from the majority of people, take them, take them away from these inflammatory posts and shitty, like negative things. So I'm like, okay, that's happening. I won't comment on it because I'm giving them even more real estate and in, in internet and, and more eyes. I'm going to post on positive things of being a great dad, a great husband, influencing my community, helping Latinos in, in Toronto. Uh, helping people become funny, confident speakers, uh, helping people with mindfulness, productivity. So that's how I see it. Is there any other way that I can take the spotlight from these inflammatory news? I think that, look, I and, and, and here's the thing. I totally understand why you wouldn't want to give them more gas by commenting on them and just making them more visible. But at the end of the day, there are some issues that we all share. You know, I mean, your thing might be comedy and public speaking and personal yeah. growth. And it's great. Keep sharing that kind of stuff because that's, that's stuff that you invest a lot of time in doing. And here's the thing. I learn a lot from the stuff that you put out because I outsource a lot of the things to you. I know that you're taking a lot of time into reading books on personal growth, yeah. on, 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 on improving your, your, your life, on meditation, all these kinds of things, on productivity. So I listen to what you have to say. And it's a way of outsourcing yeah. my knowledge of this topic to someone who I trust, which is you, right? So keep posting that. That's great. Keep sharing your knowledge with people because people will keep on uh, learning from what you have to say. But on the issues that nobody can escape, the things that like where our country is going, where, where our civilization is going, we have to be informed because at one point in time, we have to do the one thing, the, the one important thing that binds us all in a democracy, which is vote. When you vote, you have to do so understanding what's happening. Because if not, you're giving away this, this little precious yeah, thing that you yeah, have yeah. to the people that may not actually be working on your best interest. And, and to that, I say, you know, I know it's not easy. I know it's sometimes boring. Try to find, look, here's what Mariana, my, my girlfriend does. She, she will listen to news from people who, she has this podcast. I don't know the name of the podcast, but it's the, I think it's this gay guy or, the, or, or, or this couple. They're really funny and they ask questions in a really dumb way. Like they just ask people who are experts on things questions, but in a really dumb way, like I have no idea what I'm talking about and they just ask it, right? And then it makes it funny because the whole show is funny. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, you're bringing people who know about things and you're getting informed about the issues, right? So find a way, find your show. There's a lot of comedy, political comedy shows, for example, yeah. do that and, and do so from a wide range of political spectrum, you know, from the right to the left, to the center, you know, try to yeah. get informed from different places and then make up your own mind. That's what I would suggest. This is what I do in my defense. I outsource my decision and I call you. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, well, I don't understand this. What's going on? And then you explain it to me in user-friendly terms, which I think is what Mariana does it with this show. And this is the thing. And I think a lot of people are, are going through the same thing. I don't know where to go. And maybe because I'm lazy. I'm not trying to ex escape my responsibility. 
maybe if if I knew, and when people listen to this podcast, they'll probably send me a bunch of um, objective, fair, uh, thought provoking news outlets, podcasts, and things where I can inform myself. But I always feel lost. I always feel lost because I'm like, oh man, if I read the like Justin Trudeau, like I already like him because he supported the LGBTQ plus community. He looks like an okay, like a cool guy that I would be friends with. Um, and then I'll go into the conservatives, but I'm like, maybe they're just saying this on the website so they can get my vote. And then I'll go, I'll go to the NDP and I'm like, oh, they're fucking with me. Bob. So <laughs> I always don't know if what I'm reading through my lenses is the truth. So I always just feel lost and, and overwhelmed is the, is the word. So I just like, don't go. And I don't know where to start. And that's, and that's exactly what we're trying to do with this rough consensus. I, like, I'll put it to you this way. You know, there's a really, really high level, right? Imagine there's really, really high level of people who are very, very, very informed. They're a specialist in the issues that are happening uh, in the day. And those people put out, you know, papers, they do studies, they do big yeah. books that I don't have the time to read and I don't yeah. have the knowledge to understand. Then after that comes another level of people who may be pundits, maybe journalists, maybe other kinds of things. See, I don't even know what a pundit means. What's a pundit? Yeah, you know, like someone who, who argues things online and like usually a oh, political okay. pundit. Not not online. It can be anywhere, really. It's like somebody who gives out their opinions on, on, okay, on different okay. things and their informed opinions and, and, and so on. And, and they'll argue for like, I don't know, like a democratic pundit or a political pundit. Or okay, some sort. okay. But anyway, so you'll have you you'll see that there's a lower level of like journalists and people who, who are in the media who understand what all these other people put out right and that they'll transmit it to a lower level of people who are maybe the really really informed individuals people who are not part of the media they're not journalists they're not reporters they're not going to go and investigate what happens in the white house but they will trust that all these other people will do that too and that's how a democracy works and that how that's how basically like journalism should work they'll have an opinion about it and they'll express it in another way and their followers can learn and so on and so forth. If you're not necessarily interested, like I am, I'm not necessarily of like interested in reading the studies. I'm not going to spend like an entire week reading an economic study of some sort. But I will like I will listen or, or, or read an article from a journalist that I trust mm -hmm. and understand what he's trying to say. He'll dumb it down to my level. And then with disruptive consensus, I'm trying to explain it at my level so that people who are in a different level than me will understand it based on how I understand it. And then those people can transmit that information in another way. And that's how the information will transmit yeah. to all the people. So try to find a way of, of, of listening to the people that you do understand that your field identified with. Uh, you, the that's that, you for that me. Are, yeah. And so, yeah, I would say like, <laughs> read my articles and listen to, 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 to this rapid consensus and all that kind of stuff. And, and if you have any questions or if, you know, like follow your curiosity, if something, if you find something interesting, then do a little more research on that. You'll find other people that are explaining it on YouTube. There's thousands and thousands of channels, of people speaking uh, about different issues and explaining things in different ways. Also, when I do it, I do it. I try to do it in, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes or something really short. So that people that don't have the time to really dive deep in these issues, you know, they can they can listen to what I'm saying and understand it, and then they can do research on their own, you know. But now at least they have a little bit of the gist of the problem in a nice good summary in an entertaining video. That's the other thing. We try to do it in a way that yeah, it's not it's boring. Really, they're really it's entertaining good. and enriching and it makes you feel inspired and it's positive. We're not like attacking people, we're trying to make it fun, positive, good. Um that's sort of like the, the, the intention. So that's that's how I see that media landscape operating. Yeah. I'm so happy that, because a lot of people don't know, you've been doing this for years, maybe over a decade, writing thought-provoking essays, let's call it, on Facebook and, and other mediums. And I always read them and I'm like, fuck, Diego is incredible, man. Like he, he should do this more. And then now I'm so happy that over the last year, You've taken it to the next level, now informing thousands of people on YouTube, on your Facebook, on your website with Danny Gomez. And it's it's really good because you need, I need Diego in my life 
to dumb it down because otherwise I wouldn't do the homework, you know? And I think your role is especially really good because Danny and yourself, you guys are Latinos. So in as an immigrant, I'm just trying to make it, you know, I'm just trying to survive and not get kicked out of the country. Well, now, now I'm, now I have a passport, but I think a lot of us as immigrants, we're like, I don't want to fuck with anyone. I don't want to get deported. I, like, I'll just do whatever they tell me and I'll stay out of politics because politics is how you go to jail and like, whatever. So <laughs> politics is like, like, uh, like, I don't like, especially if you come from Peru and Latin America, you go into politics, you're fucked. Like everyone thinks you're corrupted. And even if you have good intentions, like everyone thinks that you're, you're a horrible person. So, um, or like you have half of the country who hates you. So right. what I'm trying to say is that you are in, I think what you're doing is incredible because you have your obviously Canadian audience, but you're informing all of us immigrants, Latinos in North America and in Ecuador and Latin America about what's going on and the issue that, issues that should matter to us in That's our right. new country. Because most of us think, oh, no, I'll just be here for a couple of years, make money, then go back. I've been here 17 years. I haven't gone back. You know, I should care more. Um, so I, I think it's incredible. And now I want to ask you to, to close off this um, life-changing interview. Um, the champagne question, which is what we ask everyone in the podcast. And it is, mm -hmm. if we were to meet a year from now with a bottle of champagne, what are we celebrating in Diego Hidalgo's life? I guess that being able to do this, what I'm doing, what I'm doing with Danny uh, in, in Disruptive Consensus, full time, being able to make something out of it so that I can sustain myself and continue to do it and not live off my savings. That, that to me would be a huge win. Uh, it will like giving myself the price of being able to do this full time without having to resort to my savings is probably my, my biggest objective. Um, so yeah, so that, that is what we would be celebrating. Um, But obviously, I would like to have a successful YouTube channel and uh, lots of lots of listeners and a big audience. And uh, I mean, I could I could go on and on. You know, it's um, but yeah, just be able to have the privilege of doing this full time without having to resort uh, to other sources of income or you know or eating up my savings. That would be that would be fantastic. I think you're gonna do it, man. I think you're gonna succeed because. You've read the One Thing book, which you recommended to me, and uh, it changed the way I see productivity and, and life and, and, and focusing, because if you do a million things, you won't do any of them correctly. And, and, the, and the question that the One Thing book has that, that really changed my life is, is, what's the one thing I can do today such that by doing it, everything else will become easier or unnecessary. I have it printed in front of my desk, so I always see it. And you've really focused, had incredible success with Disruptive Consensus with Danny in, in like only a year, man. So I, I, I know that it'll go to incredible places. I want to congratulate you for, for the success. And I think, I think we have so much to learn from you because I, I think you've been able to go back and forth navigate and pivot successfully from full-time jobs, part-time jobs, doing what you love and never lost sight of the prize, you know? And, and I think a lot of us, especially entrepreneurs, sometimes we're like, no, I'm never going back to the nine to five because, <laughs> ah, you know, and, and we're just hurting ourselves because we don't enjoy entrepreneurship because we're missing money or we didn't plan ahead. You've been able to quit, do what you love, go back, plan ahead, rewrite, quit, pivot, and you've done it remarkably well, man. So I love you. Thank you for being you in too, my man. life. Congratulations. And thank you for being on the Stefan Dyer podcast. Diego Hidalgo, Sal, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for having me, man. It was, a, it was a real pleasure. Gracias por escuchar el Stefan Dyer podcast. Arrivederci, my people.